Well, good morning, Lake Sawyer. Happy Easter. Hey, as you're finding your seat, will you stand with us? In Philippians 2, it says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Hey, this morning we get to worship our powerful, mighty King. Death could not hold him. Will you help us sing? Death could not hold you. The veil torn before you. You silenced the boast of sin.
Hey, before I say any more, I wonder if there's even any room for you to scoot in. <laughs> the, room, the room is so full. If you have room to scoot in and there's more people coming in, if you wouldn't mind doing that, keep a lookout for people trying to find a seat. We'd appreciate it. Well, my name is Jennifer. I'm one of the staff members here, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. This is... Jesus is the center of everything for us here at Lake Sawyer, and um, it's, he is everything. And so it's all founded on this day, on this Resurrection Sunday. And what is so special about today is that you are here. And so thank you for spending your Easter morning with us and being together to celebrate. It's always better when the room is packed out. So we love that you're here. If today is your very first day with us, we're so excited that you're here and you chose to come uh, and celebrate your Easter with us and we have a special gift for you. So we have this cute little coffee cart outside. It's called Palm and Pine Coffee and we would just love to buy you a specialty drink of your choice. And so the way you can get that is on the seat back in front of you there's a QR code. If you scan that it'll pull up our program. And that'll tell you a little bit about Lake Sawyer but import, most important piece for the new people is the connect card. So if you scroll down, fill that out, you'll get an email. You just go out to that cart and they will give you a coffee or a, a drink of your choice you get to pick. Today we're going to sing a few more songs together, we're going to take communion together, and then we're going to hear an Easter message from our lead, Pastor Mike Ferruli. So welcome to Lake Sawyer. Let's continue to worship. Like Jennifer said, we're so excited that you're here. Over the next few minutes of our service, we're going to take some time man, and just celebrate Jesus, our great King. We're thankful that death didn't win. Father, would you meet us here this morning? Would you have your way? Father, we love you. You give life, you are love, you bring 
bring light to the darkness you bring home you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord come on let's fill this room it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only great are you Lord you give life you give life you are the shout your praise ah will you help me say and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord ah let's fill this room all the earth all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth, all the earth, all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. They'll say,
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Without form and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Holy Spirit hovered over this boundless expanse, a limitless vast of holy waiting. Creation on the verge of dawn, heaven pressing into earth. Let there be God delighted, revealing, Cradling dirt and dust, he breathed life into being. From the very beginning, God desired to entwine human and divine, setting our mortal hearts with eternal longing. He, he talked to us in the garden, leaving his throne for mud and clay, holy love drawing near. Our deepest fears, our darkest shames could not hinder heaven's appearance. So the Spirit come to an empty womb, the Father's seed in bloom, hope infusing a weary world. God, making his way humble, came beside us as we stumbled through, a light that shines in the dark that cannot be conquered. Let there be. And so it began, Son of God and Son of Man, offering himself as the way of salvation. Jesus, man of sorrows, son of suffering. Perfect son of God in all his innocence Walking in the dirt with you and me He knows what living is He's acquainted with our grief Man of sorrow, son of suffering. him upon the cross knowing the cost still love inclined him to reach down and write in the dust our freedom from death and shame with no condemnation he declared go now and leave your life of sin Jesus carried our sorrows he knows our pain our transgressions redeemed on that rugged tree his death for our life and liberty and as he gave up his spirit earth trembled in awe creation groaning knowing surely this was the son of God so is it finished <laughs> waiting for done the earth paused in witness and then the rocks cried out their hallowed response creation inspired by the very 
very breath of God cracked with the brilliant light of eternity. Let there be Christ in glory, trampling death by death, rising in victory. Son of God and Son of Man, who was and is and is to come, Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Your cross, my freedom, your strife, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your love still speaking, your singing about the blood of Jesus, and the reality is it's his blood that makes us right with God. We're about to take communion together, and communion is a reminder of that very thing. It's a way to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross, that he died the death of a guilty person, though he himself was innocent and blameless. We get communion directly from Jesus on the night before he went to the cross. He was having a meal with his disciples. He took some bread and some wine, and with the bread he said this, is my body, which is given for you, take and eat. Then he took his cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now when you hear that word covenant, think like a contract or an agreement. That with Jesus, there's a new contract. There's a new agreement between God and man, and it's in his blood. He told his followers to do this, to eat the bread, to drink from the cup, as a way of remembering what he was about to go and do, the way his body would be offered up on our behalf, the way his blood was poured out, so that we who were far from God, we could be united with him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so on the cross, our sins were removed from us, and by faith, we receive his righteousness. Communion is a reminder that we were so broken, we needed someone to die for us, and yet we were so loved that someone actually did. And so, as Christians, if that's you, everything hinges on this. All of our hope, all of our faith, really clings to the truth of what Jesus did for us on the cross, and that on the third day, he rose from the dead. So we're going to take communion this morning as a way of remembering that Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross so that we could become the children of God. If you grabbed your communion elements on the way in, you can get those out now. If you didn't, don't worry about it. You can just raise your hand up. We have volunteers who will bring it to you right where you're at. There's also no pressure to participate in communion this morning. This could be for you a moment of quiet, a moment of reflection. But this is something that Christians do to recenter ourselves on the good news of Jesus. So I'm going, to do, I'm going to give you a moment to pray, to reflect. And when you're ready, you could take communion on your own. And I'll come back up and pray for us in just a minute. Go ahead.
But Father God, Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you loved us in this way, that you sent your son, that he would lay down his life so that we could receive life ourselves. And I pray that you would help us to rest in this good news, that we could stop striving to be good enough for you, but that we could rest that Jesus paid it all. And Father, would you help us to celebrate that the tomb is empty, that you have conquered sin and death for us, and then you offer that victory to us. Would you help us to cling to that good news this morning? We thank you for Easter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, happy Easter, everybody. Oh, it is so good to be here with you. Uh, we, we recognize that Easter is, uh, is, is a lot of fun. There's all sorts of traditions. For some of you, maybe your tradition is you come to an Easter service. And uh, we know that when you show up at church, often there's questions. Like even like we just took communion. Like what's that about? What, where, where does that come from? Do, do all Christians do that? That's just one of many questions that people have when it comes to faith and when it comes to Jesus. And we recognize that, and that's one of the reasons we have a group called Starting Point. A Starting Point is really an environment where questions become conversations, where nothing is off the table. And we are excited to be launching a new Starting Point group coming up in just two weeks, and it will meet kind of during our normal second service time at 1045, and we would love for you to be a part of it, whether that's you because you're new to faith because you have questions about faith, or maybe because you're returning back to church and returning back to faith after a long time away. Starting point is a place for you. Uh, I also want you to know as a church that we are passionate about our community. We believe that God has put us in the heart of our community with a heart for our community. And so we love to partner and to create great family-centric events. And one of those is coming up in about a month called Glow Party. Uh, the, the, we're going to glow the night away, if you will, in this room. We're going to have a DJ. We're going to have black lights. It's a family event, but it's also open to all ages where they'll be dancing. There will be uh, games and also raffle uh, door prizes as well. And we would love for you to be a part of it. It's free. You don't have to pay. But we do ask that you would RSVP to let us know how many people we can expect. And so if you want more information about Glow Party or to RSVP, or uh, if you want to sign up or get more information about Starting Point, you can access that inside the digital program. And that's available, like Jennifer mentioned, by scanning the QR code at the seat back in front of you. Uh, as we get going today, um, I have a little bit of a, a confession to make. Uh, I, I have a tendency when I'm driving to uh, just sort of zone out. Like I'll be driving and then it like some time will go by and suddenly it'll hit me like, well, how did I get here? Or, or like what just happened the last 10 minutes, and it's not because I'm on my phone, it's not because I'm on drugs, like, uh, I just, I have a tendency just to, like, start thinking about other things, and I don't mind telling you that, because here's what I know, you do the same thing. We all do, we just drive, and we're driving, and then suddenly it's like, oh wait, how did I get here, or what did I, what just happened over the last 10, 15 minutes? And I think one of the reasons why we do it, I know one of the reasons I do it, is because driving is just second nature. Like, I've been driving for so long. Many of you have been driving for so long. You don't think about the act of driving and all the things that are involved in it. You just get in your car and you start driving. Now, I tell you that because, candidly, if I'm being honest, I think that's how most of us approach Easter. Like, oh, we know how it goes. Most of us, we know how the story goes. Jesus uh, was tried. He was found guilty. He was nailed to a cross. He breathed his last breath. He was laid in a tomb. And three days later, he rose. He walked out of the tomb, overcoming and conquering sin and death once and for all. That is the Easter message. Most of us know it. Matter of fact, some of you are like, yeah, pastor, that's exactly it. You've identified it. You kind of just said what Easter is. If you could wrap this up really quickly, I'd like to get to lunch. But here's what I want us to understand. Nothing about Easter made sense to the first followers of Jesus. Uh, nothing about Easter was expected. 
What we have a tendency to look at and think, well, this is just commonplace for the disciples, it was catastrophic. And that is crystal clear as we join with the story. As we join with John's account of Jesus' death, we know that sort of he's already been tried, he's been nailed to a cross, and now he's sort of up on that cross. He's struggling, he's suffering for his breath, he's about to die. And John notes this in John chapter 19, beginning in verse 25. He says, standing near the cross were Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now, the gospel accounts, the gospel writers note that these three women are present at Jesus' crucifixion site. But there's someone that's missing. There's a group of people that are missing. Do you know who's missing? It's the disciples. Maybe with the exception of John, the disciples are nowhere to be found. Matter of fact, what we're told is the disciples are actually out in hiding. They're not there. They've abandoned Jesus in this moment. They're afraid. They're afraid of what has happened to Jesus is going to happen to them. They believe that the empire is coming for them next, and so they go into hiding. Now, you don't do this. You don't go into hiding if you knew that Jesus was going to resurrect from the dead. Like, that's not what you would do. Matter of fact, if you knew, if the disciples knew that Jesus was going to resurrect, they would be there with the women. And and all the people who are mocking Jesus and, and, and poking fun at him and dividing his belongings, they'd be like, You guys just wait. You just wait. You wait to see what happens next. If you think this is something, wait till what happens on Sunday. But they don't do that because they don't believe. It's not even on the forefront of their mind that Jesus is going to resurrect from the dead. It's not even on the forefront of the mind of these women. I, I wonder what they must be thinking as they're watching their Lord die. One of them is watching her son die. What must be going through their minds in this moment? Undoubtedly, there's pain. There's agony. I imagine, which would just be human nature, you start to reflect on all the interactions and all the moments that you shared with a person. They're probably thinking about the way that Jesus invited those who had no families into his family of disciples. They're probably thinking about the way that Jesus celebrated the kingdom of God and boldly shared the love of God with everyone, even the people. The Jewish religious elite said, no, God's not for these people. But Jesus says, I'm for those people. And thusly, God is for those people. As they're reflecting, they might be thinking about the ways that, 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 that he sort of uh, invited people into this beautiful vision of a world that he was creating. But more than anything, they're coming to terms with the reality of what they hoped for, what they longed for, What they believed in wasn't going to happen as Jesus breathed his last breath. And then we read this in verse 38. After Joseph of, afterward Joseph of Arimathea who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. You see, Joseph ensured that Jesus would get a proper burial. He ensured that Jesus would get a respectable burial, which wasn't common for a criminal. It wasn't common for someone who had been crucified. Candidly, 
to crucified people, they would take the body off the cross, sort of dispose of the body outside of town, and just trust that the wild animals and the birds would take care of everything else. But Joseph goes to Pilate and says, give me Jesus' body. And the text tells us that he placed Jesus' body in the family tomb. But it wasn't supposed to happen like this. Messiahs don't die. You, you, you can't kill the Son of God. But it happened. And the text tells us that the stone was rolled in front of the tomb. It's over. And, and then there's the disciples. Right? They're off in hiding. They, they've abandoned Jesus in his moment of need. These, these guys have given up everything uh, to follow Jesus. Literally, they, most of them walked away from their careers, some of them very lucrative careers. Some of the disciples walked away from their families to follow Jesus. Uh, they all gave up this version and vision of life that they longed for and desired to chase after this beautiful new thing that Jesus was calling people to. And in this moment, they have to be thinking, what, what was it all for? The movement, it's dead. And then John writes these words. Chapter 20, verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Mary comes to Jesus. Uh, presumably, she wants to spend time with Jesus, probably not yet ready to say goodbye, to acknowledge that what she had hoped for isn't going to happen. And we're told that when she gets to the tomb, the stone is rolled away. Now, in John's account, she doesn't even like, look inside the tomb in that moment. Matter of fact, in that moment, she takes off running to the disciples. And here, here's what we just, we're too familiar with the story. She doesn't go running to the disciples to tell them Jesus is resurrected. That's not even at the forefront of her mind. Like, she doesn't even see that as a possibility. The text tells us that she runs to tell the disciples the conclusion that she has drawn, the conclusion that most of us would probably draw. The body's been stolen. And so she gets to the disciples. She goes in and starts to tell them, like, guys, I went to the tomb. It was open, and the body has been stolen. And they think Mary's lost her mind. Matter of fact, Luke, in his account, really says, like, the, the, the men didn't believe her. Like, Mary, like, no, like, you probably went to the wrong tomb. You're just a little emotional right now. Like, no, 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 nothing. It's, I'm sure Jesus is in the tomb right where he belongs. Now, John and Peter, they decide, you know what, let's go check it out. And really quickly, they start running. This is what we read as they take off towards the tomb. Peter and the other disciple, which is John, John will often refer to himself in this book that he wrote as the other disciple. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running but the other disciple outran Peter. Now, I think this is so funny, and this is a little bit of the humanity in Scripture. John wanted to make sure we all knew for all time that he is faster than Peter. He's like, hey, when, they, when they tell the Easter story, I'm faster than Peter. So he outruns him. He gets there first. Uh, John, he stoops in and looks in and saw linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Now, here's what we need to understand. Uh, for a man to run in the ancient world was unheard of. Uh, to, to, for a man to run, they would have to hike up their tunics. They wore long, flowy robes. 
And so you'd have to sort of pick it up above your knees so you wouldn't trip over it, exposing your bare naked legs. And that would be shameful for a man in the ancient world. But John and Peter don't seem to care. They don't really know what's going on. Again, they're not thinking resurrection. They're thinking, I don't know what's happened. Mary says that the body's been stolen, probably the wrong tomb. Maybe it is. Let's go figure out, but let's not waste time. Let's run and get there. They don't care what anyone else thinks. They want to see what's happened. And so in the next verse, it tells us as it continues, it tells us then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. And he also noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up, lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, John, just in case you forgot, also went in. And the text tells us he saw and what? Believe, but like, let's say this again. He saw and what? He believed. Like this was the moment. This was the moment that everything starts to come together. Like this is the moment they begin to realize that this is not what we thought it was. It continues, it says, for until then, just affirming what I just said, until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. You see, the body hadn't been stolen. After all, who would steal a body? And matter of fact, if you were going to steal the body, the last thing you do is, you know, make sure all the linens are folded up all perfectly and put where they belong. You wouldn't do that. And the only people who would have any reason to steal Jesus' body would be the Jewish elite, the religious ruling authorities. And for them to do that would violate the Sabbath. It would make them unclean. They, they wouldn't do that. Matter of fact, in other gospel accounts, they make sure the tomb is guarded so that no one could steal the body. For John and Peter, this is the moment it all starts to come together. That there's only one plausible explanation for what has happened in this moment. Jesus did what he said he was going to do. He rose from the dead. That the resurrection and the life has come back to life. And the text says they took off Running, They go running back to all the other disciples. You can almost picture them coming, just flying through the door like, hey, guys. And everyone else in there like thinking it's the Roman authority. Like, ah. And they're like, no, 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 it's us. It's Peter. It's John. Listen, we went to the tomb. We went to the tomb, and it's not what we thought. It's not what Mary said it was. The, the body hasn't been stolen. In fact, Jesus has done what Jesus said he was going to do. That the resurrection and life has raised back to life. That what we thought was the ending, what we thought was catastrophic, is just the beginning. And what the gospel writers tell us, and what history tells us, is in that moment, the disciples re-engaged. The disciples jumped back in with the mission and the ministry of Jesus. They were in hiding, they were afraid, but in that moment, they're all back doing the very thing that Jesus called us and his followers to do. And what we need to understand is they didn't re-engage because of what they believed. They didn't re-engage because of what Jesus taught. They re-engaged because of who and what they saw. They re-engage because of what happened on Easter morning. You see, the thing is, nobody, literally nobody, expected no body. But a tomb with no body is exactly what they found. And because of that, everything changed. Rome, the empire, 
that systematically annihilated people could not annihilate Jesus. And we know this because the tomb was empty, but it's not just that the tomb was empty. We know it because there's eyewitness reports. Over the next month, literally hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, people not just the disciples, but other people, not even people who were followers of Jesus, hundreds of people saw and interacted with Jesus in the month after his resurrection. People whose lives were changed because of what happened. It would be impossible to sort of write this off as the delusions of a few people. The world changed on that Easter morning. And no one, I mean no one, saw it coming. Nobody expected it. You see, the story of the resurrection, the story of Easter, is not just some good Bible story. It is the story. It is the story that answers one of life's great mysteries. One of the questions that so many of us wrestle with, what must I do to get right with God? In the book of Acts, Peter, the slower disciple, that's not in there, but I had that for myself. Peter answers that question. He says, you want to know what it looks like for you to get right with God? This is what it looks like. Uh, each one of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, as Christians, we believe that our sin separates us from God. But because of Jesus, what he has done by giving his life on the cross for us, he has bridged that gap. He has closed the separation between us and God. That without Jesus, we have no standing before God. But because of Jesus, because of the resurrection, we have been made right in the presence of God. Jesus changed everything. And while that might have surprised his followers, while that might not have been what they expected, this was always the plan. Jesus was always coming to this earth to defeat the enemy. The thing is, the enemy wasn't Rome as the Jewish people believed. Jesus didn't come to defeat Rome. He came to defeat the real enemy in our lives. The enemy of sin and death. And so Peter says, you want to get right with God? I mean, this is what it looks like. You repent which means you literally just walk away, you turn around from your life of sin. That you willingly surrender the parts of your life that don't align with God's plan for your life. And then Peter says, you get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, baptism is this powerful, beautiful representation of death as we go into the water. And life as we come out of the water. In baptism, we get to identify with the resurrection message of Jesus. You see, Easter reminds us of God's powerful movement. That God moved towards you and me. That God closed the gap between you and me. That a tomb 
without a body was a declaration for the world for all time that God is in the business of bringing dead things back to life. He has always been in that business. Lives have changed. I've heard it once said that, that, that Jesus didn't come to make good people better. Jesus didn't give his life to make bad people good. Jesus gave his life to bring dead things back to life. And that begins with you and with me. And baptism is one of the ways that we celebrate that reality. And I'm super excited this morning to be able to come alongside and celebrate people making that decision to get baptized. Matter of fact, over the last couple of weeks, we've encouraged people in the church to take that step this morning. 13 people have decided to get baptized. And in just a moment, we're going to be able to celebrate with those people. But here's the thing. I also believe that God is asking some of you to respond. The Spirit is stirring in your heart. And maybe you're coming to grips with the reality that it's time for you to fully surrender your life to Jesus to step into the waters of baptism. And and I get it, like, you you probably woke up this morning and it wasn't on your mind. You're probably sitting here not even thinking this morning, like, oh, this might be something that I should do. But I just wonder, I just wonder if this is not the very thing that God wants you to do. I just wonder if God is not just prodding you to get up and respond. And I know even as I say that, like some of you are like, oh, well, like, you know, I got lunch afterwards and I didn't bring a change of clothes and I I did my hair and my makeup, not really ready for this. But here's what I would say. We have thought about everything. I mean, we don't have hair and makeup artists in the back, but like, (laughs) unless you're a hair and makeup artist, please meet us at the back and help people out. And we, we thought about everything We've got shirts, we've got shorts, we have everything that you need to get baptized. You know the one thing that we don't have? You. And so again, I just wonder if today's not your day. I believe with all my heart that God is writing a grand story. And he wants your life to be a part of it. But that begins with you taking a step. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you, go ahead and everyone stand up right now. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And when I'm done praying, when I say amen, what's the magic word? Amen. Amen. When I say amen, whether you have sort of pre-decided to get baptized this morning or you're making that decision right now, When I say amen, I'm going to ask that you would walk over to this side of the room, off to my left, your right. Our team would love to meet you there, and I'd love to see you into that tub. Easter has always been about surprises. Today shouldn't be any different. Where God moves, we are called and commanded to respond. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you so much for Jesus. I thank you for the resurrection, for the life that enables all of us to live because Jesus surrendered his life as a punishment for our sins. God, even though we can find some things in our life so regular, so routine, I pray we never lose sight of the unexpected beauty of Easter. And God, I thank you all so much for the opportunities that we get to, to just celebrate the decisions that are being made this morning, to celebrate people stepping into the waters of baptism. 
to celebrate death and resurrection. And we pray all this in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Amen. to be able to be here with you right now, to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and plug your nose, and I'm going to baptize you. Jesus, you die. And you raised to walk in your life. Congratulations. mom's going to baptize you, but I'm going to take your confession of faith. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The leader and savior of my life. The leader and savior in my life. Well, your mom's going to go ahead and baptize you. Laura, based on your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
and step on down. Katrina, I'm really excited to be able to be here with you to celebrate this moment, celebrate your belief in Jesus. It's because of your belief in Jesus I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And plug your nose and step forward. Buried with Christ. Honor to privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit because of your faith in Jesus, because you recognize Him as the Lord and Savior of your life. So go ahead and plug your nose. I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very good. Madison, come around this side. This is a special moment for you, an opportunity for you to publicly declare that Jesus is the leader and the savior of your life. So I have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and come your nose. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in the light. faith in Jesus that I have the privilege to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And plug your nose. Buried with Christ. It's a privilege to be able to be here with you and to celebrate what God is doing in your life, that you are surrendering your life fully to him. So I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ. Raised to walk in your life. Congratulations. What's up, buddy? It is warm. Only the best. Big, two of us. Yeah, we'll have you stand up. Don't, don't get ahead of the game here. <laughs> well, what, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross yes, to save for you for your sins? Yes, sir. Do you believe that he raised again to conquer death? With that belief, belief I baptize you in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Oh man, we celebrate the good news of the baptism. Can we give everybody who made a choice today a round of applause? Come on, God is good. We can do better than that. Come on. Ah, there's no body in the grave. No enemy can hold him down. There's newness of life. We celebrate that. Will you help me say? Because there's no body in the grave now. No enemy can hold you down. Because there's no body in the grave now. One head gets to wear that crown. Because there's no body in the grave now. No enemy can hold you down. Cause there's nobody in the grave now One head gets to wear that crown Cause there's nobody in the grave now
Hey, can we celebrate those who were baptized one more time? Praise God, that was awesome. Thank you so much for spending your Easter morning with us. We'd love to have you back next week as we start a whole new series called More Than a Children's Story. Maybe you grew up in church, you've heard some of the stories in the Old Testament, but the reality is that Scripture is so rich and has so much depth to it. Sometimes we miss some of the deeper meanings. We're going to be unpacking some of these stories that are found in the Old Testament over the next several weeks. We'd love to have you back. Also, um, if you filled out a Connect card, do not forget, you're going to get free coffee at the Palm and Pine Coffee Truck right over here. We have some donuts, we have some games, some family photos over here. Don't miss out on some of the good things. Happy Easter, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you.